Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam Ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een Imma ba'd We are continuing our readings In the work entitled Adda' wa dawa The illnesses of the heart And its cure As this work has been authored by The illustrious scholar Renowned by the name Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, may Allah, the exalted bestow mercy upon his soul. As the author passed in what year? Yarhamakumullah. The author passed in what year? 751. 751, Anno Hijadi. 751 after the Hijrah. Beautiful. So we were in a discussion concerning dua. Concerning supplication. And we discussed the etiquette of dua, what brings about supplication being responded to. We discussed Allah's greatest name and his usage in supplication. We looked at some of the preventers behind supplication being responded to. In brief, and we also looked at the secret behind dua being responded to, the secret behind supplication being responded to. We now come to the next section, Faslun a dua kasilah. Section supplication is like a weapon. The author states. Supplications, they hold the same status as a weapon. For a weapon is with the one who is carrying it. And the weapon is dependent upon the individual who is carrying that weapon. So a weapon is not only dependent upon itself. A weapon is not a self-dependent device. So whoever has a weapon that is complete, without any defects, without any flaws, and the individual utilizing that weapon has the proper strength, has the proper skill set, to utilize that weapon. And there is nothing to prevent <clears throat> the effect of that weapon. Then in this scenario, the weapon will be effective against its target. But if any one of these three is lacking, then the impact of that weapon will also be lacking in accordance with what is omitted from this equation. For perhaps the dua itself, perhaps the supplication itself, is not a righteous supplication. Perhaps the supplicant, the one who is supplicating, has not properly gathered his heart and tongue, his presence inside of the supplication that is being uttered. Or maybe there are some other external factors that prevent the supplication from being responded to. For if this is the case, then it is possible that the desired effect from the supplication will not come to fruition. Question. What are some things that can prevent one supplication being responded to? Some external factors. Because we have the individual who is supplicating with the supplication. We have the supplication itself. And there are other external factors involved. What are some external factors that may prevent 
the supplication of that person being responded to? Sinning. Good, sins. Correct? What else do we say? A person's belief in that dua. So the level of the person's iman in what our Lord has stated concerning supplication. And your Lord has stated, supplicate to me, make dua to me, and I will respond to you. It's a promise from Allah. But possibly the person's iman in that verse is not where it should be. So then the iman of the individual has impact upon the strength and potency of the dua. Possible. Faslun. Bain dua wal qadr. Section. The relationship between dua and qadr. Between supplication and predestination. Between supplication and fate. Supplication and the divine decree. Before we present the author's discussion, and this discussion is the focal point of our discussion today, what is the relationship between supplication and divine decree? What do we say? Relationship. Okay, we'll uh, we'll forward this. Further. <laughs> we'll forward this so the author states here we have a famous question a reoccurring question it is this whatever we are supplicating for if it has already been decreed then it's already binding that it occur. Regardless if the servant supplicates or does not supplicate. Do you have any doubt in Allah's qadr? Do you have any doubt in Allah's decree? you doubt fate? you doubt destiny? No. So if Allah has decreed something to occur, is it going to occur? Yes, yes but... MashaAllah. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, we, we, we understand that Qadr is the divine or David of Allah, but Dua in itself can argue against that Qadr and possibly change if I'm saying it right. Okay, good. So, so we're saying there is divine decree, we believe in it, but Dua can have impact upon what Allah decreed. Yes. So Allah has all knowledge of all things. Let's unpack this. Okay? So, <laughs> when we're speaking about Qadr, when we're speaking about Allah's decree, we're speaking about four things. We're speaking about four levels. Allah's knowledge... Of all things, his knowledge is infinite. He has knowledge of the past, of the present, of the future. He has knowledge of what will occur, what will not occur, and what will not occur if it were to occur, how that would occur as well. Correct? Okay. So he has knowledge of all things. He knows what's going to happen. He, so that's the first level, knowledge. Uh, the second level when it comes to Allah's decree is Al-Kitaba a record he has recorded all things that are to occur until the day of resurrection 50,000 years I'm coming 50,000 years before existence before the creation of the heavens and the earth. The first thing to be created was what? Adam. Way before Adam. Adam was the first human being. Yes, the first human being. Absolutely. The first human. 
He was not the first one on this planet though. The jinn preceded us on this planet in inhabiting it. And as a creation, uh, as a sentient creation, the, the angels also preceded humanity. Uh, so the first thing to be created, we said, was the pin. So the pin was created. The pin was in order. What was the pin ordered? To write. To write. The pin said, what shall I write? You follow? And fast forwarding this a bit, the pen was in order to write what? Everything that will occur until the day of resurrection. So are we at the day of resurrection? No. So everything that is going on now was already recorded 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. So that's level 204. The third level concerning our belief in Allah's decree is what is called al mashiah the will of Allah. Allah wills whatever it is to come into existence. He wills whatever it is to occur. And then the fourth level is al khalq Allah creates whatever it is that is going on in our existence. So when we say that Allah is the creator, this is not limited to the past tense. But this is an attribute of Allah that is a living attribute, that is an ongoing attribute of His. He is the creator and He continues to create however, whenever He so wills. Does that make sense? Okay. So you made dua for something. We understand the four levels of belief in Allah's qadr, belief in his decree. You may dua for something. So what you may dua for, Allah doesn't have knowledge of it. He does. What you may dua for is not already written in a loh mahfuz. It's not already written in the preserved tablet that the pen wrote in. Or is it written? What you may dua for. So you're, you're making dua for something that is beyond the will of Allah. And they do not will, except that Allah wills, Lord of all that exists. So we have will, yes, but our will is under the umbrella of the will of Allah. We cannot go outside of that, right? Let's test the theory. Fahim, raise your right hand. Good, that's your will. Fahim, levitate. Right, that's Allah's will. Right, that's Allah's will. So we have will... Our Lord has will, but our will is under the will of Allah. So you make dua for something. Was your dua beyond or outside of Allah's will? Good. So you as a human being that is making dua, did Allah not create you and your ability to make dua? So how do we answer this question then? So now we're going to come back to the question. We're going to reiterate the question now. All right? We ready for it? Okay. Whatever you are supplicating for, or rather, if whatever you are supplicating for has already been decreed to occur, then what is the benefit in the servant making dua? Because regardless, if the servant makes dua or not, what Allah has already decreed is going to occur. So then, why even make dua in the first place? We understand the question? Yeah. Speaking about the relationship between dua and qadr, between supplication and predestination, yes. I'm going to answer the question. Um, so it has to do with frequency. Right? Frequency. Right. So okay. Or, or, or intensity. So if intensity. So spectrum. It's not black and white. Right. So let's say, for example, it's, it's decreed that you're going to be sick. However, the level of sickness, how long the sickness lasts, that that has, that has not been decreed, or that is what your dua can affect. Okay. So frequency, intensity. So it's, it's it's decreed that you will become ill, but how ill you're going to become is not necessarily decreed. Or the dua can affect. Is that what we're saying? 
Or so we're switching now. Prepared. So let's, let's deal with the first. Okay. So you will become ill, but how ill you become is not decreed. Is that what we're saying? No. I'm saying your no? law can affect what is. So let's say it's been decreed you're going to get sick. It's decreed you're going to get sick. And let's say that let's say you're going to be sick for five days. That's a decree. You're going to be sick for five days. That's the decree. That's the decree. Right. However, your du'a and your iman and what you've done can lessen that. So maybe it's not five days. Maybe it's two days. Maybe it's one day. Your du'a, your iman, uh, can impact that. So instead of five days, it becomes three days that you're ill. Right. For example. For example. Okay, so, so let's take that. So then, 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, what was written in, in the Loha Mafud? What was written in the preserved tablet? Five days or three days? Okay, so. Or does Allah not know, or did Allah not record it? That, that, that also depends, because the decree comes down in different stages. The decree comes down in different stages. Right. So it wasn't written 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. The hadith is wrong. No, no, I'm saying, for example. The, the decree that comes down when the love of my was created, the, the decree that comes down when, uh, when you're born and the angel whispers in and loads your soul in, the decree that comes down over the year, mm -hmm. the decree that comes down, uh, the other hadith that mentioned the decree between the between the Fajr, between the, between the Jumu'ahs, like there's the different stages, it's not all the Different ones. stages. Right. So what the rest of us said? We understand the question? So so what's, what's our answer? Uh, Mateen, you were, gonna, you, were, you were trying to... Is it the level Get a word of, of it's already decreed that things will, will happen at the particular time it's going to happen. Allah already already knows that. Um, uh, when, mm -hmm. If we offer du'a, Allah already knows that we, we will offer the du'a and it opens up the door for Allah to show his mercy mm -hmm. at the time of if, if Allah want to show his you know, if the law wants to show his mercy at the time of the du'a. Okay. Is, is, is it something in that range or something is, in that is, range? Is opening up the door for the law to show his mercy uh -huh. when 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 the servant offer du'a so, at so, that particular time. So when the servant makes du'a, this then opens the door for Allah to show his mercy. If he so wills. Not if 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 he so wills. If he so wills. I mean, at that particular time, mm -hmm. or later, or well, later, at, at, at any time you want, anytime, anytime he know. wants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do our sisters say? We, we we understand the question, and I actually can't see that far, so I I, I need to hear. Um, what do we say? Everyone understands the question. Yes. So how do we respond to the question? What, how do how do we harmonize that? What do we think? Yes? Allah's written is what's going Allah's written what's going to occur. And he knows the decisions we're going to make. Okay, so that does not preclude us from making our decisions and whatever decisions that we make and even the du'as that we are going to make, that in and of itself is actually written. So we are as, but we don't know what is written. So we have to make those decisions and, and go through that destiny. Interesting. Okay, we're going to come back then. Yes, Sheikh Sharif. I believe the divine, divine decree doesn't change. The divine decree does not change. What's written is not changing. Uh huh. But we still have to make supplication to our Lord. But we still have to make dua. What's written is written. What's written is written. Yes. And we still have to make dua. Yes. 
So the question then becomes why? If, if what's written is written, why make dua? Because regardless if I make dua or not, it's already written. So why make dua? It's a bit of a quagmire, huh? Uh huh. Okay. I'll do Jabbar. Because we were created for worship. Good. So if we say that we were created for worship, that would mean two things. One, that would bring us back to regardless of whether we make dua or not. What we're going to receive, we're going to receive. But, dua itself is not utilized in order to receive what we're going to receive. Dua itself is utilized because it is an act of worship. So we're supplicating with dua as a pure act of worship, not necessarily to change what Allah decreed or to get something that we want or desire. In that line of thought. Okay, so Ibn Qayyim mentions everything that you all have mentioned. So we're going to go through his presentation. So we ready for it? And then I'll, I'll follow it up with an, with, the, with an answer to one of the things that you said that's not mentioned here in the text. So we ready? Okay. So concerning this question, he states... So there are a group of people who actually think this is a valid question. And because of this, they leave off dua. They leave off supplication, saying that there's no benefit in supplicating. You follow how they can come to that conclusion? Uh, okay. Yeah. These individuals who, due to their ignorance, in their misguidance, they actually contradict themselves. For this school of thought, this viewpoint, makes it binding to negate all asbab, to negate all means to bring about a result. By default, these people have to omit the means that bring about a result. Omit the cause that brings about a result. So then, it should be said to one of these types of individuals who think this way. If you are full, if your thirst has been quenched, then this has already been decreed for you that your stomach will be full. And your thirst will be quenched. Whether you eat or you do not eat. Therefore, you shouldn't drink. And you should not eat. <laughs> you see the fallacy in this, in this logic? Okay. And if the individual would like to have a child, it's already decreed whether you're going to have a child or not. Whether... You engage your wife or not. So then, there is not even a need for you to get married. There's no need for you to have a spouse. Because whether you're going to have a child or not has already been decreed. So don't get married. Would an individual who is an intelligent human being Say something like this? No. no. Rather, even animals understand enough to put forth a means to achieve their goal. Yes or no? When an animal would like to eat, what does the animal do? It goes out, it searches, it scavenges, it hunts. It puts forth with the efforts, it will utilize its senses, its legs, its wings, whatever it has, it's going to put forth all those means to eat. It doesn't stay in one place and just wait for its stomach to become full. Yes? Hence, we have the hadith. 
لو إنكم توكلون على الله حق توكله لرزقكم كما يرزق الطير تغدو خماصا وتروح بطانا If you all were to place your trust in Allah whilst giving him his due right of placing your trust for him your trust in him then he will provide for you all the same way he provides for a bird every day the bird leaves its nest with an empty stomach yet every day the bird returns back with a full stomach means trust reliance upon Allah let's move forward so then this would mean the individuals that have taken this line of thought that they are actually less intelligent and more misguided than cattle in this vein. Some of them are a bit more intricate in the level of their logic. So they will say, occupying oneself with dua, occupying oneself with supplication, this is from the perspective of pure worship. Pure worship in and of itself. And Allah rewards the supplicant for supplicating. Without the supplication having any effect, having any impact upon whatever it is that you are requesting. So with this individual, there is no difference between the one who supplicates and the one who does not supplicate inside of the heart and upon the tongue of the individual relative to the effect of the supplication. Relative to the effect of the supplication. Okay? So we have a second group. We understand the first group. The first group is saying, Allah has decreed whatever he's decreed. It doesn't matter whether you make dua or not. The second group is saying now, your supplication in and of itself, or your supplication as an independent entity, is an act of worship. And Allah rewards you for that act of worship. But the supplication itself as an independent entity has no effect upon whatever you're asking for. It's what the second group is saying. We follow? Okay. So if we understand this, the relationship of dua relative to what you're asking for has no difference than being tied to silence. Say it, don't say it, supplicate, don't supplicate. There's no relationship there between your supplication and receiving whatever you are asking for. And we have yet another group, a third group, that has a higher level of intellect than the preceding two. And they say, dua is a sign. Supplication is an implication. But it is solely that. It is an indicator that our Lord the Glorious raises uh, in it being a sign of the need of the servant being fulfilled. Meaning what? Meaning the fact that you are supplicating is a sign that the need you are supplicating for is going to be fulfilled by merit of you supplicating. So when Allah then grants the servant success in whatever the servant is supplicating for, then the receipt of whatever you're supplicating for is a sign that your need is being fulfilled and that Allah's decree has occurred. 
We follow that line of thought? So far, so good? We still have a bit to go. Uh, and this is the case, as he states here. Of course, we can understand it. We're actually experiencing what he's saying now. And this is like when you see dark clouds in the sky during the winter. When you see dark skies in the when you see uh, dark clouds in the sky during the winter, then this is a sign that what is going to occur. Rain. Rain. It's a sign of that. You follow? Has it rained yet? No. But the fact that the clouds are there is an indicator that the rain is going to occur. This group is saying, likewise, in your supplication, this is a sign that the clouds are a sign. That whatever you supplicated for is going to occur, meaning the rain is going to descend. Meaning Allah's decree has taken place. It's a sign of that. And these individuals, they say that the verdict upon act of obedience is directly adjoined with the reward. Disbelief in sin is directly adjoined with punishment. Uh, so because they are directly adjoined in this fashion and they are not actually two separate entities then obedience itself disobedience itself these are just merely signs of reward and punishment without there being any causality in between the two So, with these individuals, there is no distinction between something breaking and being broken, something burning and being burnt, something being killed and the soul exited from the body. In reality, what's being said here, these individuals, they are not accounting for cause and effect. So, if this is the case, then they are actually opposing reality and sound judgment. Further, they are opposing legislation and the fitrah. One's innate intuition. And the remaining body of the intellectuals laughs at them in their logic. The correct view is that there's actually another category that is here. And the category is outside of what the questioner has presented. And it is this. The divine decree occurs by way of means, by way of causes. Does that make sense? Allah decrees whatever he has decreed. But he also puts forth a means for that decree to take place. There is a cause for that decree to take place. There are triggers. There is cause. And then because of the cause, there is effect. Does that make sense? If we understand that, then we have to understand dua to be a means. Dua is a cause that brings about the effect that our Lord has decreed. That is the relationship. We still okay? All right. So there is no decree independent of the cause for that decree to take place. There is no decree. Dua is the cause that brings about. Dua, uh, dua 
is from the causes that brings about decree. Right? The finality of decree. Uh... So the creek is not independent of its cause. But rather the cause is also decreed. The cause is also within Allah's qadr. So whenever the servant presents the cause, then the effect takes place. Then what has been decreed takes place. And whenever the servant does not bring, whenever the servant does not present the cause, then the effect does not take place. Meaning that effect was not decreed. We see? And if we understand this, then we understand that your stomach, it being decreed for your stomach to be full, it being decreed for your thirst to be quenched, was also decreed along with the food that made you full, along with the drink that quenched your thirst. It's not separate. Cause and effect are both from the decree of Allah. And dua is from the causes that are within Allah's decree. Within Allah's qadr. So, if it is decreed for a person to have a child, then it is also decreed for the person to have the relationship to, uh, uh, to bring about that child. To cause that child to come into existence. And... The author brings other examples as well. For example, he says, If there are crops, then the crops were planted. If it is decreed for you to, to bear your crops, whatever the proper argo is for that, right? Uh, then it was decreed for those crops to be planted. Likewise, It has been decreed for the soul of an animal to exit from its body by way of the animal being slaughtered, by way of the animal being sacrificed. This is the cause that brought about that effect. Likewise, the entrance into paradise is decreed for the servant in accordance with the actions of the servant. And the entrance of the servant into the five hell being decreed is decreed, but it is decreed in accordance with the actions that are the cause for the servant to enter into hell or to enter into paradise. Does that make sense? Let's take it a step further. Now. So is the author saying here, by its mentioning, it's decreed for you to enter into paradise or, or the fire of hell by way of the actions being a cause for you to enter into paradise or hell. Are we now saying that we can offer, in, by way of our actions, offer an equivalent value for interest in the paradise? Can you put forth enough good deeds in number or a deed that has a high enough quality that it is equal exchange for your interest in the paradise? No? Yes? You say so? Only if Allah decreed it. I don't got my glasses. That's, that's the board. May Allah preserve you. Better Kalafi. We asked him about you yesterday, Brother Cluffy. Uh, what do we say? We offer you the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that you all know. The Prophet Wasallam has informed us 
that no one will enter into paradise except by the mercy of Allah. Even you, O messenger of Allah, say even myself. Meaning what? Meaning that there's no one that can offer any range, any extent, any frequency, any number, any quality of deed that is equal exchange for paradise. Allah still has to be merciful. We're still short. He still has to be merciful. And by way of his mercy, allows us into the paradise. So then what is the author saying here then? Because we're speaking about cause and effect, right? So what is the author saying here? When the author says, your interest in the paradise has been decreed. And the cause for that is your actions. So how do we understand what the author is saying here? If we're saying that the only way to enter into paradise is by the mercy of Allah, not your actions. So how's the author saying this here? We, we, we understand the question? Yes. That's the question. The sisters, we understand the question as well? Yes. One more time? Okay. We only enter into paradise by way of Allah's mercy. Right? Even the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Okay. And he's saying this to the Sahaba, to the companions. We're not them. So if they need Allah's mercy to enter into paradise, we definitely need Allah's mercy to enter paradise, right? And they said, well, if not us, what about you? Oh, Messenger of Allah said, not even me. So I said, right? So Allah's mercy is needed to enter the paradise for all of us. The author is saying that if it's decreed for you to enter into paradise, the cause for you to enter into paradise is your actions. So how do we rationalize the two here? We see the disparity? So how do we, how do we bring this full circle? Unless it's a contradiction, unless either the author is wrong, the, the, the hadith is wrong. So how do, how do we bring this all together? Yes. The actions are a cause for what you're trying to achieve. Take your time. Take it down. We're obligated to worship. Which will bring about a lot pleasure. Huh? <laughs> he, he was digging deep, digging deep, huh? What do our sisters say? How do we harmonize this? Yes. He's already written what we're going to do, correct? That's the connection between the two. Good. So what you're saying is actually the wisdom behind performing actions when Allah's already decreed everything. Right? As the Prophet ﷺ stated, stated, كُلٌ مُيَسَّرْ بِمَا خُرِقَ له. Uh, Facilitation will be brought for whatever you've been created for. So if it's been decreed for you to enter into paradise then the actions of the people of paradise will become easy for you or facilitated for you at some point throughout your life. If you've been created for hell, if that's what's been cre- decreed for you in your life, then the actions of the people of hell will become facilitated for you at some point in your life. You follow? Okay. Now, to answer this question though, 
There's no contradiction between what the author is saying in the hadith of the Prophet I said that we present it. But harmony is here. No one enters into paradise except by Allah's mercy. And it is the actions of the servant that earns the servant the mercy of Allah. Because you, your actions themselves cannot be in equal exchange for paradise. But your actions can earn you Allah's mercy so that you can be entered into paradise. We follow that? Okay. If we understand this, then we offer you a further benefit just as a sidebar. The servant enters into paradise in accordance with the mercy of Allah. But there are a hundred levels in paradise. Hadith in the Bukhari. There are a hundred levels in paradise. The level of this servant in paradise is in accordance with the iman and the taqwa of the servant. The level you achieve in paradise is in accordance with the level of your spirituality and your piety. Does that make sense? Tell you. So the author continues. So this party is the party that is upon the truth. This is the party that is correct. And this is what the original questioner was prevented from. It was not granted success in within the question that was presented. The original question. If everything is decreed, why make du'a? Because du'a is a means to achieve the effect of what Allah decreed for you. That is the answer. Does that make sense? Okay. Therefore, du'a is from the strongest of means. Du'a is from the strongest of causes to bring about the desired effect. So, if it is the case that whatever has been decreed for you to receive in your supplication has been decreed for you by way of your supplication, then we see the fallacy in the logic of the individual who then says there's no benefit in me making dua. Who says there's no benefit in me supplicating. Because your supplication is included inside of the other. Included inside of the divine decree of Allah. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, bring us back out. We were all the way in. Everybody's going to bring us back out. Further. You're saying that the dua is a means for us to obtain what is already written. But if you don't know what's already written. If you don't know what's already written, good. Written, Keep going. You are making dua with the hope of. Because the premise of the statement assumes that you know what's written. You say, okay, the person is going to go to paradise. Yes. You need to go to paradise. Mm -hmm. And you make a dua or your actions. The means of your entering paradise has also already been decreed. The means of your paradise has also decreed. But, but, but you don't know that it's good when you go to paradise, and you don't know the means. We don't know certain for us to go to paradise. Right, and you don't know the means that are written. So that leaves the servant... We don't know the means that are written? Right, for yourself. You don't know what means are written for you. That's revelation. The means is revelation. Right, but you don't know. We have revelation. For yourself, for individual, myself. Go ahead. Right, so the individual, let's say it's decreed for me to go to the hellfire. It's secret. Um, may alpha a bit. I, I like the paradise discussion okay, better. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Okay. And that means the means for me entering paradise is also decreed. The means for you entering paradise is also decreed. Right, but I don't know either. But you don't know. Right. So so in, in reality, what you're saying is you don't know what the means are that are gonna earn you a lot of mercy to enter the paradise. Which is why the Prophet Sallallahu said, don't belittle anything from the good. Because you don't know which good deed it is that you're going to perform that's going to earn you a lot of mercy into the paradise. You don't know which deed it is you're going to perform that's going to tip the scales in your favor on the day of resurrection. We don't know. That's the wisdom behind it. So we, we try to take benefit of all that is good. And we rush to perform all good deeds. 
That's the wisdom. Because if you knew exactly what deed it was <laughs> that you were going to perform to earn you a lot of mercy, you wouldn't do anything else. You wouldn't do anything else. And in you're not doing anything else, you may then prevent yourself from a higher level than paradise. So there's wisdom in Allah keeping certain knowledge from us. Allah must have. There's wisdom in certain matters being of the unseen and us believing in the unseen. You follow? And this is the nature of our spirituality. It's belief in the unseen. This is actually the definition of aqidah. This is the definition of theology, of our spirituality. Right? al majmua min al-masail al-ghaybiyya. Nu'minu biha iman in jaziman. Wal imanu biha wajib. So, aqidah, our theology, our spirituality, it is a collection of matters of the unseen. That's what it is. It is a collection of matters of the unseen. That we believe in adamantly. Certainty. And our believing in it is obligatory. That's what Akita actually is. That's what this is. You follow? Concerning our Lord. Have you seen Allah? That's from the unseen. Concerning the angels, do they exist in the realm of, uh, in, in a realm where we can readily perceive them? No. All the books, you've seen all the books? 104 books. How many have you read? You follow? So all these things are from the 124,000 prophets. How many have you met? You follow? So these are all matters of the unseen relative to us. Right? And we say this understanding, al ghayb al nisbi uh, the absolute unseen and the relative unseen that we've discussed before we won't go into that so we don't veer off too far uh, if we understand this then this brings us into a deeply spiritual relationship with our Lord we don't belittle anything from the good we do everything that is good we put forth all good deeds knowing that the deeds will earn us Allah's mercy, but we don't know which deed it is that's going to earn Allah's mercy. We don't know which deed that we, we were sincere, that we went to, meant to be sincere. We don't know which deed it was that we, implement, that we implemented and emulated the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam to the extent that we are meant to. We don't know. So we do it all. And as frequently as much. Uh, and as, as frequently as we can. And with the highest quality that we can. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Given that du'a is the means and everything you mentioned so far, how, the answer is the answer to your question a rhetorical answer of the how does du'a affect the qadr? It is rhetorical in a sense. Okay. Right? How does du'a, and we didn't say how does du'a affect the qadr. We said what is the relationship between du'a and qadr initially. Definitely. Right? Definitely. Our brother Naeem brought us into, you know, du'a impacting qadr, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not misplaced either. And the time, is, uh, the time is moving, so we'll get ready to close. Um, we'll finish out Ibn Qayyim's statement. We'll offer a point from ourselves. We'll close out. So we understand this. It should not be said that there's no benefit in eating and drinking. It should not be said there's no benefit in movement. It should not be said there's no benefit in action. But rather, all of these things are means, they are causes, in order to achieve the effect. Whilst the cause and the effect is from Allah's qadr. The cause and the effect is from Allah's decree. And there are no means that exist that are more beneficial than dua, than supplication. And there is nothing that is more profound in achieving whatever it is that you desire, whatever it is that you are seeking. The author goes on 
to mention some examples from the companions in this regard and some mindset for the companions in this regard. But we'll forego that into, until next week. We offer you this. We spoke about the levels of the qadr. We spoke about the levels of Allah's decree. Yes? Therefore, al-ilm, al-kitaba, al-mashia, al-khalq. Knowledge, record, will, creation. We spoke about that. So when we speak about belief in the qadr, we have to believe in these four levels. Once we understand that, let's put that to the side. There are four types of qadr. There are four types of Allah's decree. Firstly, we have al-qadr al-azali. We have the eternal decree of Allah. The eternal decree of Allah. Al-Qadr al-Azali. The eternal decree. This is what exists inside of al al mahfuz Inside of the preserved tablet. So far so good? This is the pen recording everything that will occur until the day of resurrection. The four types you said? Huh? Four types. Yes, the four types of Qadr. Okay. Next, we have Al-Qadr Al-Umri, we have the decree of lifespan. We have the decree of lifespan. And this is what we have in the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud. May Allah be pleased with him. That comes in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. When the angel, or excuse me, when, when the angel uh, enters the soul into the fetus, Right? After four months, approximately. And then a, another angel records what is to occur in that person's life. Their, the length of their lifespan, uh, their, their provisions, what their actions are going to be, and whether they will have a fortunate or unfortunate end, a righteous or a wretched end. Okay? That's Al-Qadr Al-Umri. That's the decree of lifespan. There is a third type, Al-Qadr Al-Hawli, the annual decree. And this is what occurs, Laylatul Qadr. One of the reasons why it's called the Night of Qadr. And this is what is laid out for the upcoming year. This is part of what is going on with the angels on that night. What has been laid out for the upcoming year. As well as the deeds of, the, of that year, or this, or at this point, the previous year, ascending to Allah. All this is going on on that night. The night of decree. You follow? This is the type of decree that's occurring. What's going to occur for the upcoming year. Then you have Al-Qadr Al-Yawmi The daily decree or the daily measure Another understanding of Qadr is measure إِنَّا كُلَّ شَيْنَ خَرَقَنَاهُ بِقَدْرٍ And we have created everything with a Qadr We have created everything with a measurement Right? Which is actually where I was going with Ibrahim May Allah preserve him When he was mentioning that Well the person being ill is decreed, but to the extent that the person is ill is, right? But you, you backed off, so I couldn't, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So everything is measured out. The amount of, the, the exact number of steps you will take in your life is measured. The exact number of beats of your heart is measured. Uh, the exact number of leaves to ever exist, measured. The exact space where every individual leaf will fall, measured. Right? Every step that you will take, the place where you will take that step, measured. Everything is measured out exactly for every single thing that exists. Human beings, animals, the jinn, the the angels, the uh, planetary bodies, molecules, atoms, right? Whatever the uh, physicists are finding, and actual physicists that's beyond the level of atoms, I forget the name of it, right? All that's measured out exactly, all of it. All of it. 
right? Uh, to this level of manushe. So we have al qadr al yomi, the daily measure, or if you like, the daily decree. And this is the recording of the angels on your right and your left. Okay? This is the recording of the angels on your right and your left. So far, so good? Let's take the plunge. Now, when you make dua, when you have deeds of righteousness, that can impact the daily measure, the daily decree. It can impact the annual decree. It can impact the decree of your lifespan. But it cannot impact al qadr al azali. But it cannot impact the eternal decree. Why? Because the succeeding three are all included inside of the first. We follow that? And when we speak about the decree of lifespan, this is what our, well, this is what our Lord has, has ordered the angel to record. Not necessarily what's written in Elohim Himafuz. In finality. Not necessarily was written in a preserved tablet. In finality was going to occur. You follow? This is just what the angel has been ordered to record. At that moment in time. At the time during the, the fourth month where the soul is entered into the fetus. The angel records at that time. You follow? Good. When the angels are giving their orders for the upcoming year. That's their orders for the upcoming year. That's not necessarily what's written in the preserved tablet in finality of that year. We follow that? When the angels are recording your deeds on a day-to-day -day basis, that is not necessarily the finality of what's recorded concerning your fate in the preserved tablet. You follow? Because our records, they will be presented on the day of resurrection. But there are things that will be removed from our records on the day of resurrection that are to our benefit. You follow? Everything is recorded. But there are some evidences to implicate that. Those deeds that we performed that were just mubah. Was just, they were just permissible. Right? They're not, they weren't deeds that you'll be rewarded for, that you earn sin for. Person just talking, person just walking, whatever it is, that those things may be removed possibly from the record. It's also possible, and you want to be from these people, it's also possible on the day of resurrection that Allah may turn your bad deeds into good deeds. That's an adjustment in your record. And we want that because we all know we have enough bad deeds. May Allah forgive us. May Allah make us better. Amen. May Allah make us the righteous. Amen. You see? So just because the angels are recording this on a day-to-day -day basis, this doesn't mean this is, the, this is what your record will be in its finality in Allah's preserved tablet. So again, the final three can be impacted by dua, can be impacted by supplication. The final three can be impacted by righteousness. You follow? Even once provision, we know from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that joining the family ties can increase one in one's wealth and extend one's lifespan. Meaning, from these three areas of qadr. You follow that? But all three, or the succeeding three, are included inside of the first, al qadr al azri the eternal decree. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Correct. Correct. So, so the sister is mentioning the hadith 
of the first of the people to be thrown into the five hell. Um, and there are three of them, a person of knowledge, you have a, a, a person who, who fought in battle, and you have a person that was wealthy and generous, right? A person courageous in battle and fought, passed, a person generous gives wealth, and in the four a person of knowledge who conveyed knowledge, person of Qur'an, and convey what they have of Qur'an. Uh, all three will be brought, uh, and it will be asked, what did you do right, with this? And they will say that I did action... Y uh, or X for your sake, Y for your sake, Z for your sake. Right? We said connect. You have lied, but you did this so that it can be said you are a scholar. You did it so that it can be said you are a good Quran reciter. You did it so that it can be said that you are courageous. You did it so that it can be said of you that you are generous. What The Hadith says, and it was said, meaning that was your intent for why you did it. You already see your reward for it in this life. So you have no reward for that in hereafter. You already got it because that was your intent. Right? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلْ مِرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Acts and premise upon their intentions and everyone will have that which they have intended. Does that make sense? Okay. So then this person uh, will be taken, dragged on their face and thrown into the fire of hell. Good. What the sister is saying that this speaks to the, the same point um, in saying that the angels record whatever deeds that they performed but Allah knew their intent, so what was written for them in finality uh, comes to fruition on the, on the day of resurrection, that their finality is that uh, it was not for the sake of Allah and they will be cast into the fire of hell. Um, yes, correct understanding with a caveat. And that is that the heart has its own actions just as the limbs have its own actions. And the intention is an act. The intention is an action independent from the physical act itself. And the angels record our deeds, both external and internal. So the fact that a person was insincere in the deed was recorded by the angel as well. So, with that caveat, what you're saying is, what you, the point that you're making is, is sound. The point is sound. And the point is correct. And valid. Have that. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala Muhammad.